evening, everybody. Good evening. Good to see everybody out on this beautiful evening. Midweek service. Tell you what, that's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it just helps you get through the rest of the week. And um, I love coming to Bible study because that's, that's the best part when you come into Bible study. And um, we can dig into God's Word and, and see things from the past that still apply today and learn things from uh, the mistakes of others. And um, So it's all good. So I am so glad that you made it here tonight. And uh, if you didn't remember, we are in the book of Exodus. We'll be in chapter 16 tonight. Just, I like to check with them, see if they stay up with me. Chapter 16 tonight in the book of Exodus. We have crossed over the Red Sea, and we are moved out into the wilderness. And so uh, we're going to talk about something tonight called, What Is It? That's what it's called, What Is It? And I'll explain that to you in just a little bit. Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, and then we'll go from there. Father, we do come to you tonight, and we are so excited to be in your house. It is a blessing, Father, always to be in your house and gather together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, Father, to open your word and, Father, just take the bread of life, to study your word, to see not only, Father, the things we can learn from uh, the history, but also what we can learn to apply to our lives today, Father, because it's just as relevant to us today as it was to them all those thousands of years ago, Father, and we're so excited that, that it is. It's, it's the only book, Father, that we can read that is still applicable just like it was even then. Father, we can look at our lives and use it as a measuring stick. We can use it as medication to heal our soul. We can use it as training, Father, so that we might walk better. And Father, we can always use it as inspiration to help us to get through the hard times. It does all of those things, and we're so excited. Father, tonight we give you the glory for it all and we ask it in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. So, um, we'll be in chapter 16. We're going to look at verse 1 and we'll hold there just a minute. Verse 1 says, Then they set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of, and most people will look at that word and say sin. sin. The wilderness of sin. There are many that say it's pronounced Sin, the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. Now, there are those, the reason that many say it's pronounced Sin is because it's the wilderness of Sin on the way to Sinai, right, to Mount Sinai. So uh, we can look at that. Some look at it and call it the wilderness of sin. I say if they're in the wilderness of sin, that's probably accurate too, right? Because uh, that's exactly what's about to start happening. And um, uh, that seems to be where most of us end up all the time in the wilderness of sin. Uh, so tonight we're going to take a look at this. So on the 15th day of the second month, it says. 15th day of the second month. Now that's significant. You know why? Because it's one month after leaving Egypt. They left Egypt on the 15th of the previous month. So one month after leaving Egypt, they are now across the Red Sea. They have been celebrating and singing the praises of God and Moses, and they, now they're in the wilderness of Sinai. And so one month later, they came out from Elam, which was an oasis of rest and comfort, right? Remember when they found that, and, and Moses threw the uh, branch in the water and made it sweet? And so they rested there for a little while. And um, so after they rested there for a little while and got rested up and got some water in them and ready to go, now they moved out into the wilderness between Elam and Sinai. And so they headed towards Sinai. Why were they going to Sinai? Mount of the Lord. It's the mountain of God, right? Yeah. They were heading to Sinai, the mountain of God. They were going to meet with God. That's why they were going there. The whole purpose, why did, it, why did Moses say, why was he continually telling Pharaoh, let my people go? Why did he want to let my people go? So they can go out into the wilderness and do what? Worship. That's the whole reason Moses was saying, let my people go. That's exactly what they were doing. They left Egypt. They came out of slavery. God delivered them from slavery. He delivered them from their captors. He brought them through a miraculous crossing of the Red Sea. He destroyed the captors in front of their eyes and even washed up their bodies on the bank to show them how powerful he is. 
They came through the desert and they're on their way to Sinai for the very purpose of worshiping God, which was the reason they were leaving Egypt in the first place. That's what God was, that's what Moses kept saying. Let them go so they can go out into the wilderness and worship God. That's where they're headed. They're headed to the mountain of God. Um, in the original text, the name uh, wilderness of Sin has nothing to do with sin. Um, however, it could absolutely be the wilderness of sin because we see what happens while they're out there. Right? All right. So that's exactly where they're headed. They're moving towards the mountain of God. Everybody's moving. All 200 of them, right? Yeah. Over, a, over a million. Over a million. That's a big group of people, isn't it? Yeah. That's a lot of people moving out there through the wilderness, and they're all headed to one place to worship. <clears throat> well, wouldn't it be amazing? We opened up the door Sunday morning, a million people showed up. Wow. Awesome. We might have to move out into the parking lot. We might. <laughs> it would be a great thing. But, hey, I, I, I tell you what, just think about this. Across our nation on a Sunday morning, we know there's over a million people that are worshiping God, right? Yeah. We know there's over a million people that are gathering together for worship on a Sunday morning. Yeah. But what we really know is it's a whole lot less than it should be. That's right. It's a whole lot less than it should be. These people have moved out of some tragic places. They've left, and now they're headed to worship God. Look at verses 2 and 3. 2 and 3 says, The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled. Now, just a few minutes ago, when we were reading, they were singing praises to God, how great he was, how wonderful Moses was for leading them, all these wonderful praises. And now, then they stopped for a minute, they started grumbling, they said, we don't have no water. Yeah. They come upon some water, it was bitter. God told Moses, throw off the branch in there. He tossed it in the water, it became sweet. They all drank, they got full of water, they're ready to go. They move it out into the wilderness again. And no sooner they got out in the wilderness again, they started to grumble. It says, The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So, they wanted water. They got water. Now they want food. I mean, you just can't satisfy them, right? <coughs> they got water. Now they want food. Now they say, we're hungry. We're hungry. We need some food. They complained because they didn't have food. Now listen, here's the thing. They just left there. Remember, when they left Egypt, they left with provisions, right? Remember, he told them to pack up everything, take the bread with them, but don't put any leaven in it. Get all that stuff and go take all of it with them. They had everything they took with them. So now what we know is that more than likely their provisions are running low. Now, when it said we're starving, they hadn't been without food for a week. What happened is they looking back and look, they did like, like, uh, like I do. You go in there and you open up that package of Oreos and there's only two left. And say, oh my goodness, I'm almost out of Oreos. <laughs> I gotta run to the store <laughs> cause I'm running out I, what am I gonna do without them that's how the people were acting they had food but they were getting low on provisions and now they're making out and they're saying oh we're gonna come out here in the wilderness and starve they hadn't even given God a chance yet they said we're gonna starve to death we're running out of food they're looking down the line see and they're saying we're gonna starve uh, back in Egypt, it was so great. We had all these pots of meat, yeah. and we had the bread, and we had... Now listen, isn't it amazing that the only thing they remember about back in Egypt is how they had plenty of food to eat? Mm -hmm. They don't remember how Pharaoh was working them 20 hours a day, mm -hmm. how they were getting beaten, and, and all the stuff that was happening, all the terrible things that was going on. They somehow forgot all that already. Yes. The only thing they're thinking about now is, well, at least we had plenty of food back then. So you brought us out where we had plenty of food so we could die in the wilderness. Is that what you wanted to do? You want to bring that up? I forgot all about all that other stuff. The only thing that's on their mind is we're running low on food and we're starving to death out here because they don't see how God can take care of them. Now, to be fair, if you're standing out in the middle of the desert looking around, listen, there's no Winn-Dixie over there but we're going to get some groceries, right? 
There's no Walmart on the horizon. No. There's no Burger King to go through the drive through They don't have any of those, that stuff out there. They're looking out and they see desert. And they're thinking, how are we going to have food to eat? How is it that, that we're going to... There's nothing here. So we're going to run out of our provisions very shortly and we're out in the middle of the desert. There's nothing. They have not yet given God one chance to take care of them. Not one chance. They just looked out and they saw their human concern and they said, well, that's it. we got nothing else. You know, isn't it amazing? You stop and just think about that for a minute. It's only been 30 days since they left captivity. It's only been a week or so since they crossed over the Red Sea. And when they stood before the water and they had nowhere to go and the Pharaoh and all his men were behind them coming to kill them and they stood between all that and they said, oh, we're going to die. And they watched God just go and open the Red Sea. Walls of water piled up on both sides. They crossed over on dry land. Nobody could have ever predicted that that was what was going to happen. They looked at that and they said, there's no way. And God said, let me show you. There's a way. Now they're out in the middle of the desert. They just saw this probably less than, like I say, probably less than two weeks ago. They just saw all this. Now they're standing in the desert. They're looking at their, their pack of Oreos is getting low. And uh, they're looking out there saying, oh, how is God going to do this? How is he going to take care of us? There's no way. There's no way. We see nothing. They forgot the miracles already. They already forgot how God brought them out. And so they're grumbling and they're complaining against Moses and Aaron. And they said, we don't have enough food. We're going to starve to death. You brought us out here. Well, listen, when we were in Egypt, we had plenty of food. Don't, never mind they was working us to death and beating us and, and doing all the terrible things to us. Forget about that bad part. But we had food. We had plenty of meat and we had bread. We had all that stuff that we needed. He said, you brought us out here to kill everybody. Well, if Moses just wanted them all dead, they would all be killed in Egypt. If Moses really wanted them all dead, he could have done that. He didn't bring them out there. He's out there with them. You brought us out here just to kill us all. Oh, uh, hello? I'm standing in the middle of you. I, I, you don't see no pockets on my, my dress, do you? I don't have no food you don't see. I'm right here with you. They didn't see that part. Oh, you just brought us out here to die. No, he didn't bring us out here to die. But the whole point is that so many times we see all of the negative and we forget about all of the positive. Y'all heard the statement, what have you done for me lately, right? What have you done for me lately? God brought them through all that stuff, but today, oh, we're running out of food. Forget all the other stuff. God takes every single one of us. You know what he did this morning? He gave every single person in here a miracle. You know how I know that? Because your eyes are open and you're breathing. He woke you up. He put your feet on the floor. You made it here tonight. What a miracle. That's a miracle. But we get out of the bed every day and we go and the first thing that happens, we have a little adversity. Or something happens and the first thing we say is, I just don't understand why I have to have all this trouble in my life. Okay, but God... But God, y'all remember God? You know, God's bigger than that. But we do the same thing they did. We look at our situation and we have dire circumstances. Maybe not be that bad, but that's what we think. And we've never given God an opportunity to even do anything yet. We just say, well, that's it. That's it. Remember a widow that said, oh, I don't have any food for you. I got just enough to make a bread cake for me and my son, and we're going to eat that and die. There's no hope. There's no hope at all. And then uh, a man by the name of what? Elijah? Yep. Said, uh, no, here's what you do. I'm a, uh, God has sent me here. Make me that cake, and he'll take care of it. And he made the one, and guess what? There's still more in there. Every day there was just enough. How did that happen? But God. God did it. Instead of looking at what we can see, trust what we don't see. Trust what God can do, not what we can do. When we count on self, we're never going to be satisfied because we're never going to satisfy ourselves. 
People that have more than anybody else in the world are not satisfied because they still don't have enough. Right. We're never going to satisfy ourselves. Only God can do that. They complained against Moses and Aaron and said, Oh, we're going to die out here in the wilderness. We're going to starve to death. <clears throat> Moses didn't throw a fit. He didn't jump up and start screaming. Don't y'all remember? He didn't do any of that. Listen, God could have said, You know what? Them grumbling people, I'm just going to get rid of them. He did later on say that. Um, them grumbling people, I just wipe them out. God didn't say that. Right? At that point, what happened? Let's look at verse 4 to 5 and see what happens. Verse 4 said, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction." On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. As they gather daily. When's the last time y'all went outside and, and watched bread rain down from heaven? <laughs> I hadn't seen it. Guess what? Neither had they. They hadn't seen any bread raining down from heaven. But God said, I'm going to rain bread down from heaven. Now, some of them must have believed it. Because they just saw what God did with the Red Sea. Some of them must believe. Some of them were probably still real skeptical. I, I've, never, I've never seen rain come down from heaven that was bread. So I, I, don't, I don't know about that, but we'll see what happens, okay? I, I, will, I will believe it when I see it, right? We'll see what happens. Some of them probably had that attitude. Now, it was a remarkable promise because brain doesn't... Brain. Bread doesn't usually <laughs> rain down from heaven. Maybe I need some brains to rain down from heaven. Bread doesn't usually rain down from heaven. But God promised that he was going to do it. Now listen, the thing is, the way God said he was going to provide them bread was not how they would have expected. They thought they knew how God would take care of them. You know, God's going to give them something How's, they're gonna, how's it going to be taken care of? They're going to round the corner and there'll be a great big field of grain and they can just pick all the stuff, make all the bread they need. That would, that would make sense, right? But no, God didn't say that. There, there wasn't a caravan that showed up bringing all fresh supplies. There wasn't anything like that. I'm going to rain down from heaven bread. Already made. Already made. Well, now they did take it and they did cook it after they got it. But he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rain it down from heaven, right? So they decided they'd take a look. But then he said, look, I'm going I'm to bring this bread down from heaven, but I'm going to test the people. I'm going to test them. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring this down from heaven. It's going to be on the ground, but there's going to be a test. How's the test? They can only take so much. And we're going to see what happens. Can they take more? Or this is all they can take. Um, said this bread from heaven is called manna. Okay? And um, the reason that it's called manna is because when they went out to look at it, they said, what is it? I will talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So he said, I'm going to test them. This is how much they can take every day, but on the sixth day they're going to get twice as much. Why would they get twice as much on the sixth day? Because the seventh day was a day of rest, right? So that meant there was no gathering and cooking and all that stuff on the seventh day. They would be able to rest. But there'd be twice as much. Well, it seemed like if you could gather up twice as much on one day, then certainly you should be able to gather up twice as much on the other day. But that's not what God said. He said, I'm going to test them. Now, he didn't say, walk outside and open your mouth and I'm going to drop the bread in. <laughs> right? He didn't say that. He said, I'm going to rain it down, but you have to go gather it up. Yeah. He provided, but you still had to work for it. Right? See, that's how some people think, well, God ought to just take care of me just like yeah. that. I ought to be able to just walk out there and open my mouth and God feed me like a little baby bird. Right? No, that's not what God said. You still have to work for it. I'm going to provide it for you, but you still have to gather it. Yeah. You still have to harvest it. You still have to do all of those things. It's not something that you're going to just stand out there and get it. Look at 6 through 8. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. And what are we that you grumble against us? Moses said, This will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning, for the Lord hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against the Lord. So, in the evening, he said, you will know. Well, here's the thing. Out of all the stuff that happened, you would think they already would know and they already would take these experiences and they already would understand that um, the Lord is God. You will know that the Lord has brought you out. All that they should know. But he said, in the evening, you'll know. And in the morning, you'll see exactly what the glory of God has done. Now, listen, that glory of God that they're talking about, that, that sheer divine presence, that's what they're going to see. Yeah. That sheer divine presence. One way that, that God had shown, already shown his glory <coughs> is he had given them mercy and goodness when he brought them out, right? He brought them out, and he showed them the way, and he parted the water. He did all of that. But he said, uh, Moses said, he hears your complaints against the Lord. The people thought they were just complaining against Moses and Aaron. Yeah. But he said, who are we? we, we we're nobody. We're just leading y'all. We're just telling you what God said. It's not us. You're complaining against us, but who you're really complaining against is God. That's the one you're really complaining against. It's not us. Who are we? We're nobody. But God will do it. When the Lord gives you meat, in to eat in the evening, you're going to know. Um, in in 16.4, God promised to give bread from heaven in the morning, but he also promised to give meat in the evening, right? So he's going to give them both. So let's see how that worked out for them. Put with me to verses uh, 9 through 12. 9 through 12. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to all the congregation, the sons of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumblings. And it came about as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel. They looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. That means they saw it, right? They saw the, the Shekinah glory of God. They saw it in the cloud. The people saw that. Now, there are some that say, uh, the Scripture doesn't say, did they hear what God said to Moses or, or did they not? There are some that believe they heard what God said to Moses. I'm not in that camp. I don't think they heard what God said to Moses because later on we know when God spoke, the people said, don't let God talk to us anymore. That's right. If God talks to us, we're going to die. Don't let God talk to us. So I feel like that if God had truly spoken and they heard it here, they would have been terrified. So there are some that think maybe they heard. Certainly Moses heard. Certainly he heard exactly what God had said. And he said, you will see all of this in the morning. You're going to know. At twilight you'll eat meat. In the morning you'll be filled with bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? I don't know the Lord. That's what Pharaoh said. People of Israel that came out, some of them were still trying to figure it all out. They'd seen all of the miracles that happened. They'd heard the word spoken to them. They knew what God had, had spoken through Moses. Moses had shared all that, but yet still many of them were struggling to know God. They were struggling to know Him, to, meaning to have a relationship with Him, to know 100% to trust Him that He's going to provide. He says, when this happens, you're going to know that I am the Lord. You're going to know that because you can see it. You're going to not only see it, you're going to consume it. You're going to be... Uh, given the bread to eat and the meat to eat, and your life will be filled with that glory of the Lord. It's going to be given to you. So look at 13 and 14. So it came about at evening, the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. 
Pine is frost on the ground. So, God provided in a miraculous way. Now listen, these quails that, that they're talking about here, they actually regularly migrate between South Europe and Arabia across the Sinai Peninsula. They are, this is the description, small bullet-headed birds with strong but low flight, usually roosting on the ground or in the low bushes at nightfall because they're exhausted and they're unable to take off again. So they have flown as far as they can go and they finally get down and rest on the ground and they can't take off and fly anymore. Makes it easy to pick them up, doesn't it? There they are. So God provided them. They flew in there at night, landed on the ground, and they could just pick them right up. By the way, they're very tasty. <laughs> Since they, they, they are very good to eat. They're good for eating. They're very tasty. They're a favorite delicacy of the Egyptians. Uh, the Egyptians loved them. Now, the thing is, God provided them. You say, well, okay, but did God really provide them? Or did they just happen to be where the quails were going to land and they were worn out so the people were able to get them? You know, did that just happen? Um, well, listen, God does things however he wants to do them. So if God decided he was going to have the quails fly right there where they could just pick them up, then God provided it. Here's the thing. Well, was it, you know, was it a coincidence? It said... At evening, he didn't say at only one evening. So if they continue to do it over and over again, then it's pretty easy to see God was providing that. He had them fly to that location, and he had all of that happen. So they provided those quail. God provided those quail to the people and put it right there for them. Then there was a small, round uh, substance as fine as frost that was on the ground with the dew. It was very small, it was round, um, little, it was more like, it's been described as like coriander seed, which is about the same size as a sesame seed, okay? So that's, that's how fine that is, little bitty seeds is what, about what it was laying out on the ground, that's what they could see. So it was very fine, very small, looked like frost on the ground, and it had to be swept up from the ground. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I don't think I could go out in my front yard and sweep up frost and not get some grass or dirt or something all up in it, right? So if I go out there and try to sweep it up, I'm going to have remnants from the ground that's going to be all in my bread, right? Um, I mean, I like, you know, nine grain bread, but I don't think those are one of the grains. Um, I, I don't think dirt was included as one of the grains. So he says it had to be swept up. So um, some people, this is what Jewish legend says. Um, Jewish legend says that the reason that it could be swept up and not have dirt in it is that when they say when God sent manna, he first sent a north wind to sweep the floor of the desert and then a rain to wash it clean and then the manna descended on the clean ground. So when they swept it up, they didn't get all that in there. Now that's what Jewish legend says. That's not... That's not in that's not in scripture. But listen, could God could God have done it that way? Absolutely he could have done it that way. Did he do it that way? I don't know. All we know is it says manna was there and they had to go out and sweep it up off the ground. So it's just as likely to me that God made it so that when they swept it up off the ground, nothing would stick to it. That's right. So he'd sweep it right up. So I don't know exactly how he did it, I just know that he did. Amen. So it's there on the ground. They have to go out and sweep it up. They said it tastes sweet like honey. Um, it was either baked or boiled. They cooked it either way. They either boiled it or they baked it, and that's how they ate it. Okay. So they did cook it, um, but they they scooped it right up on the ground. Uh, in numbers, it says they ground it on millstones or they beat it. Uh, they beat it out and they cooked it in pans and made cakes. And so. Uh, it was very versatile. They could do a lot of things with it, right? They went out there and they got it right up off the ground. So it's an amazing thing that they were able to do. So here's the thing. Um, in this, this small round substance, this what it was, um, it was very difficult to, to tell exactly what it was. Today, the Arabs, when they talk about it, they call it uh, mon, uh, which is actually formed when a tiny insect punctures the bark of a tamarisk tree drinks the sap, and exudes a clear liquid that solidifies as a sugary global when it hits the ground. 
Um, but when the sun comes up, it disappears, it melts. Well, that'd have to be a whole lot of insects putting out a whole lot of stuff, wouldn't it? Um, so definitely not that, but it's similar. It's fine as frost on the ground, right? So very fine, it's out there. And when the sun came up, it was gone, right? It went away and the sun burned it up. So they only had a certain amount of time to get out there and scoop it up, okay? Look at verse 15. Verse 15 says this. When the sons of Israel saw it, they said one to another, What is it? What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Now in Hebrew, what is it is translated manna. So when they went out and looked at it and said, manna. That was the word, the Hebrew word. I mean, what is it? That's how they named it, manna. They went out and gathered up what is it every day. They gathered up the manna. That's where the name came from. What is it? They didn't know what it was. They didn't recognize it. They'd never seen it before. They didn't know what to expect when God said he was going to rain down brain from, uh, bre again, we're in brains. <laughs> His brains are just falling out of the sky. He's going to rain down bread from heaven. They didn't know what to expect, you know. Maybe they thought it was going to be like at Lambert's when they throw rolls at you. I don't know. But, um, you know, they didn't know how they were going to go out and bread was going to be there. It was going to be fine like frost. But they, they certainly did not understand so when they go out and look and they see this stuff on the ground, what is it? But then God said, you need to collect it, right? You need to harvest it. And so they were supposed to harvest up so much, we're going to talk about that. So uh, it's uh, the manna from heaven called manna because they did not know what it was. So verses uh, 16 through 19 says this, This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer apiece, according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much, and some gathered little, according to the number of people in the tent, right? Um, and then when they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Moses said to them, let no man leave any of it until morning. So they each needed to gather whatever they needed, right? Uh, and so they were to go out and they were to gather an omer for each person. Now, how much is an omer? Well, there are places that an omer is described as as much as a gallon, right? But then there's other places that, that it's described as a cup full. So how much is an omer? I don't know. It's exactly what they needed. It's a tenth of an ephah. It's, it's, it's exactly how much they needed. The whole point was some gathered little, some gathered much, but when they measured it out, it came up to exactly what they were supposed to have. They measured it out just exactly right. And so that was given to them, every person in their tent. If they had, you know, ten people in the tent, they, they got more than if they only had five people in the tent. But they gathered up, and it was supposed to be exactly enough for them all to eat. And then they said, not only gather it up, but don't leave any of it until morning. Eat it all. Yeah. Why? Because it was exactly how much they needed. It wasn't, if they ate it all, they weren't going to be stuffed. They weren't going to be overly full. They weren't going to be gluttonous because it was exactly what they needed. But they needed to eat it all. Don't leave any. Eat everything. Okay? God provided in exactly the amount they needed. Exactly the amount that they needed. So what an incredible thing to think about that. Look at verses 20 through 21. 20 and 21 says, But, I know this is shocking, but they did not listen to Moses. <laughs> and some left part of it until morning, and guess what? It bred worms and became foul, and Moses was angry with them. They gathered it morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat, but when the sun grew hot, it would melt. Moses was angry with them. It bred worms and it became foul. The camp stunk. Why? Because they gathered too much and this stuff was spoiled. It was nasty because they did exactly what they were told not to do. 
God said, do this, and they said, nah, we're going to do more than that. We might want a snack later. We're going to get a little extra. No, that didn't work out. Didn't work out at all. Some of the people failed God's test. How did they fail the test? Because they disobeyed what they were told. They did exactly what they wanted instead of what God had told them to do. They gathered it every morning, supposed to be according to their need. But there was none left over for the next day. Therefore, they knew God provided it every day. You know, think about this. God can provide it enough manna, and he could have made it last. He could have put enough on the ground. They could have gathered enough to last a whole week long if, they, if he wanted to. And they could have gathered it all up. But you know what? He increased their dependence on him by putting it fresh every single day. Only enough for today. Do you understand that that's exactly how God blesses you today? He gives you enough for each day. He gives you enough for each day. God is new every morning. We're new every morning. Every day we're supposed to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him. Every day is a new day. God, we trust Him every day. And when we do that, then those provisions are there. We just have to trust Him every day. That's exactly what He was doing with the Israelites, and it's exactly how He wants us to live Trust Him for the provisions of each new day. Trust Him every day. Now look at 22 through 30. 22 through 30 says, Now on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is a Sabbath. Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. Now, some of them had to be pretty skeptical because of what was happening when they tried to do that, right? Uh, but this is what you're supposed to do. So they put it aside until morning as Moses had ordered, and it did not become foul, nor were there any worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather on the seventh day. The Sabbath, there will be none. It came about on the seventh day, that some of the people went out to gather. But they found none. <laughs> he already told you it won't be there. But once again, they went out and tried. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. How long will you continue to go against what I'm telling you? Don't go out there. It's a Sabbath. What did they do? They got up and went out looking for more. Even though he said, don't do that. God gives us all these blessings and he tells us exactly how we're supposed to do things. If we study God's word, he gives us exactly what we're supposed to do. But we know better than God. And so we decide to do it our own way. We decide, oh, well, if, if one is good, two is better. Right? No, that's not what God said. We decide, well, I know we're not supposed to do it that way, but you know what? I think it will be better if I do. No, going against what God said is never better. It's always worse. The people went out to see. Well, he didn't ignore that. He said, how long are you going to continue to go against what I tell you? He didn't just ignore that they went out. He pointed that out, that the people were doing exactly opposite of what he asked them to do. I truly believe that in this world today, one of the reasons why we have the struggles that we have and we have so much evil and all the things going on in the world is because God's people refuse to do what God has told us to do, and we try to do it our own way. And I really believe that if we did what God told us to do, things would be a lot different. A lot different. So, again, he said in verse 27, On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, and they found none. The Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instruction? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath, so remain everyone in his place. So the people rested on the Sabbath. They finally did that. Even though that's not what they tried to do to start with, they finally realized that's what they had to do. So 31 through 36 says this. 
The house of Israel named it manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and its taste was like wafers with honey. Then Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer full of it be kept throughout your generations, that they may see the bread that I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer full of manna in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The sons of Israel ate the manna 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omerful is a tenth of an epith. Now, here's the problem. I don't really know exactly what an epith is. We have all these different measures and there are things that are, again, if you look at different places in Scripture, they're described differently. So there are some that say, well, this is the official measure, but when did it become that official measure? We don't know that. So we have some idea, but at the same time, we don't really. What we know is it's exactly what God wanted them to have each day. That's what we know. Okay? So that's actually pronounced ephah. But anyway, um, <clears throat> the house of Israel named it, what is it? They called it manna. We've already talked about that it was like the little coriander seed. It was very small particles. But the whole point is um, it had to be gathered carefully. They had to do it, and they had to gather it carefully in order to make sure that they gathered what they needed. But it tasted good. It tasted like honey. It didn't give them stuff that tasted terrible. It didn't put stuff out there and say, here's the bread. It tastes like cardboard, but it'll fill a hole. <laughs> right? He said, here it is. Eat it. It's good. It tasted good. So they ate it, and it was good. A pot full of bread uh, that, that they talked about, they filled, they put it in the Ark of the Covenant. That's what it's talking about. To be kept for all the generations, there was a, a, a jar with an omer of manna that was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. And guess what? It didn't smell foul, and it didn't get worms. Because it was just what God told them to do. Um, they ate it for 40 years. 40 years. Every day they went out, and there it was for 40 years. And you know what? You'll find out later when you study, even when they got ready and crossed over, they still went out looking for it. Even though God said, I'm not going to provide it to you anymore. They still went out looking for it. So they ate manna during that entire time. So they knew. They knew the whole time that God was taking care of them. It's, it's, it's a, um, one uh, commentator said, it's a powerful picture of Jesus. When you think about this, after Jesus fed the 5,000, the people wanted him to keep feeding them. Since you fed us like that, just keep doing it. We want to eat from you. We want what you have to give us. We want you to keep providing for them. The people in Israel were provided with the manna, and they wanted to just keep doing it. They wanted it to continue to be that way. But the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world, it says in John chapter 6. So here's some things to think about. Jesus is the bread from heaven. We have to receive him like Israel received the man. Right? He's, it's aware of our need. They were hungry. Each for himself, family by family. Every day provided it. Humbly, we need to accept Jesus, perhaps on our knees, right? Humbly, we need to do that. Jesus is provided for us every day. He's provided for us humbly with gratitude, knowing that we don't deserve it. That's how we need to receive Jesus knowing that we don't, under, don't deserve it, and eating it, taking the gift inside to our innermost being. Jesus said that I am the body, and uh, this is the bread, right, yeah. given for you, and we're supposed to eat that. Right. And so when we do that and we take it in him every single day, then it's actually what fulfills us when we do that. And when we do that, he said, I'm living water, right? You drink what I give you, you'll never thirst again. If you eat the bread that I give you, you'll never be hungry. And what he's talking about is that you will be full of God. You'll be full of the Holy Spirit. You'll be full of all of that. The problem that we have is um, we go looking for other stuff. We go looking for other things. It's like this. They say most people are somewhat dehydrated. But that most people go and get something to eat when their body's trying to tell them they're thirsty. 
they mistake the thirst for hunger and they go and eat when they're really needing something to drink. They need water. Most people get that confused. We go looking for something other than Jesus when what we really need is Jesus. Okay? So think about that. Think about that. We will continue in this study of Exodus. We'll be moving into chapter 17 next week. And we'll be finding out about some water and a rock, I think, next week. So uh, we'll be continuing on with that. But uh, just, just think about how the people continue to do things in their own way when they should have been doing things God's way, right? All right. For those of you who have joined us tonight online, I thank you so much for tuning in. And I pray you'll come back and join us again next week when we look at chapter 17. For you, God bless and good night.